Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Today, we're going to talk about how we can unlock the power of AI in your classroom. We do recognize and realize the fact that AI is taking over the world, and we do um, know that there are concerns that goes with that. But today, we're going to look at it from a proactive point of view, and in some way, we're going to try to see what we can do to stay ahead of our students and what we can do to use it inside of our classroom. We have a panel of four faculty members from this different disciplines. They're going to all share their point of views. We have three questions for them. They're going to answer those questions. And then at the end, we're going to share some tools uh, so you can take it with you and hopefully you can use it in your own classrooms. We're going to start by introducing ourselves. Christina. Hi, my name is Christina Cross, Professor of Business with LSC Online. Amlan. Hey, everyone. Welcome. Uh, this is Amlan Data. I teach mainly economics. I also teach one or two business courses per semester at LSC Online. Julie. Hi, I'm Julie Duncan, and I teach accounting also with LSC Online. Thank you. And my name is Nina Javoher. I teach computer science. I've been in the education for 24 years and let's go ahead and get started. So let's go ahead and start with our first question for our panelists. Uh, we're gonna start with you, Christina. What is your opinion on using generative AI in education? So I'm cautiously optimistic. Um, businesses are already embracing generative AI and I teach business. Um, and I think if we scare our students off of using it, they're going to be at a disadvantage when they enter the workforce. Um, but with that, if we encourage them to use it without critical thinking, then we've also failed them. Um, AI, I picture it more of as an assistant. So for example, if you're the CEO of a company, and you have your administrative assistant um, type up a memo, do you send it out without reviewing it? You're accountable for what's generated, what's released, what's sent out. So picturing AI as a helpful assistant or a patient colleague to brainstorm with, I think it can be very effective. So I'm optimistic about its use, but I don't think, um, I don't think it should be used without guardrails. Thank you, Amla. Thank you, Nina. Um, great question. What is your opinion? Well, I don't have one. Okay. Why? Because I am open. I am experimenting. I'm trying to learn. Um, there, there's so much that's going on right now around us. And in, in terms of fear mongering also that AI is going to take away your jobs. Um, that happened when the computers first came that computers are going to take away your jobs. So I'm keeping an open mind. I'm experimenting. I'm learning. Um, taking baby steps. So um, I really have not formed an opinion, but I'm in the process of forming an opinion. And I I, I like to experiment with it uh, before I form an opinion. And I'd just like to mention that a few years ago, I read uh, some leader, world leader actually had said that the country which masters AI is going to dominate the world. And that sort of struck me and it has stayed with me. And that, that's how I look at it. So, you know, I, I'm going to look at how we can use AI for our students, for ourselves, and um, take it from there. Thank you, Amla. Julie? Yeah, so as an accountant, we are mostly an overhead cost in a business. And so there's a lot of pressure as an accountant or accounting department to always do your job better and more effectively. And I think AI is the next wave of that pressure to be successful in business as an accountant. And so we're already seeing pressure from industry to incorporate generative AI as far as, you know, data analytics and other things and, and using that effectively. And so again, as an accountant with that hat on, those who do their job more effectively are promoted and paid better. And so I wanna give that lens to my students to be embracing technology and to be using it effectively for their job. Thank you, Julie. And I myself as a software engineering, a software engineer and, um, who did get a certification from Intel from uh, in AI and knows the backbone of how these things are actually generated and developed and what programs are running it. Um, the power of deep uh, learning and neural network is gonna take over the world. So I, I think we need to embrace it. Um, 
And, and I agree with what Christina said. We cannot not have a guardrail. We need to be very careful with that as well. There are some concerns um, that needs to be addressed, definitely. But embracing it and making our students prepare for what's coming in the future, I think it's a very important factor as well. Now, without further ado, let's go to the next question, which talks about how do you utilize generative AI in your classroom to engage students? So we're going to start with Christina. Hello. So I'll answer this question with an example of one of my assignments that I ask students to, um, to use AI to submit. Um, so I have a discussion um, on investments. Um, we, we learn about the different types of investments in this class. And um, I tell the students, you've got $100 to invest. Now I want you to go to AI and ask how it thinks you should invest that $100. Um, then they go and compare the results from, um, from what AI gave them to what we've learned about in the class. Um, once they've taken a look at that and analyzed it, I then ask them to prompt AI to ask them questions to help improve its own results. And it will do that. It will ask them things like, um, what are your long-term goals? Um, you know, uh, how long or when do you need this money? Um, in the future. And so they answer those questions. And of course, it gives a, a much better result once it knows um, what the student wants uh, to do with the money, ultimately. Um, so not only are they learning from this assignment, the learning outcomes, because we're talking about the types of investment, and of course, they're learning that, but they're also learning about how to interact with um, the AI chat tool. And they're learning how to improve the results that AI is giving them. Because oftentimes, if you ask a very basic question, you get a very basic answer. Um, but if you're giving it more details or even asking it what details it needs to improve its own results, then you're now learning how to better leverage that tool and make it much more, um, much more precise and accurate. Um, so that's one example of how I'm using AI um, in my classroom to engage students and to introduce them to the tool. Thank you, Christina. Amla? Um, thank you, Nina. Um, I would... Um, extend what Christina just said. Um, I'll just give an example of how this one instance, how I use, um, I take the help of generative AI. Um, I have assignments online and my in different, uh, different assignments. And I, I think I have great instructions. I think I give, I give my assignment instructions and I'm very clear about them, but I always get students writing to me, I didn't get it. Can you can you explain what, what are you really looking for? Um, so one of our instructional technologists suggested, and I was talking to him about this, like, you know, I thought I make great instruction, but they don't understand. Some of them don't understand. Uh, what can I do? And he just off the cuff mentioned, why don't you try um, generative like chat GPT and type in your instructions and see what it throws out. And I did that. And I found that the, the language uh, generative AI used was probably a little easier for our students, more simple because, you know, I know my stuff, but the students don't, and they're trying to learn. So I used that approach using um, AI to improve my assignment instructions. And I don't know, it's, I'm, it's in a very basic stage right now. Like I said before, I'm taking baby steps. This semester, I have had very few queries about you know, what did you mean by that? What did you mean by this? As far as the instructions are, uh, were, were concerned, maybe, maybe uh, it is making a little, it's making it a little easier for our students to understand the instruction. Of course, I'm going to be working on it and I've already thought of some ideas which I can do uh, to make it even better. But yeah, that's one way I, I um, used AI and one example. Uh, maybe another one I, I, I'll just add on, it's very similar. Um, I have a requirement of citations uh, for whatever our students say uh, in, in, in discussion or uh, discussion boards. And um, I used ChatGP to, to generate uh, something related to how, how you should cite. And obviously I modified that to my liking, but it, it gave me a very basic template or a structure on the basis of which I could help my students, you know, uh, cite, cite in the, in, in the, in the, points that they're talking about. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, you. Amla. Appreciate it. Julie? 
Yeah, I'll give an example <clears throat> of a assignment I created recently. So for my classroom for accounting, we have a learning objective that's not actually covered in any of our accounting textbooks. And it's to discuss the differences between US accounting and international accounting. And it's not actually in any introductory textbooks, it's in more advanced textbooks. So uh, I've made a discussion where students are creating an accounting policy or memo or that they're thinking of a scenario to move their company's headquarters from a U.S. company location to a country that's using international accounting rules. And so I've asked them to use AI to, again, generate that policy, that they come up with a scenario, what type of business they are, where they're thinking of moving, and some key things that they should know. And so I'm also asking them to use some best prompt tips, like our colleague Tim Mosel has taught us, to have AI take a role. Are you a small business owner? Are you a CFO? And also consider who your audience is. And so they're, again, using AI to draft that. And then I ask them to reflect on it critically, and I give them excerpts from some intermediate textbooks, some websites and also to check the sources that AI is using. So I ask their AI in their prompt to at least uh, contribute to sources and do those sources actually exist? Are they reliable and things like this? So it's a critical thinking exercise to get them using AI, to get them starting an accounting policy or memo, which again is a good use of AI and accounting to be more efficient. Um, and then also, you know, companies are very wary of putting any private financial information into AI. And so we're not starting with any type of financial information, just an email or a policy. And so that's gone pretty well. Again, I'm, I'm learning and changing my directions and tweaking them as they go. So it's been a learning process for me as well to change the directions and get the students the type of results and critical thinking that, that I was wanting in the first place. So it's a work in progress. Thank you, Julie. It, it is work in progress for all of us. In my computer science courses, I um, now it has become very easy for students to just type in the prompt. So I've been and and get the program. So I've been uh, trying to be more careful about how I created my uh, my prompt and what I ask my students. Uh, one one of the things that I've been doing and the students are having fun with AI um, doing it, but as well as giving me their authentic work as well, I tell them to write this program in the simplest way possible, and then um, write and then write it in you know have AI write it for you to increase the efficiencies, you know, finding a time, time complexity for certain, um, whatever time complexity that I that I want them or whatever structure that I want them to use. And I asked them to submit both of them, both sides, their work and then how they got it improved. And that itself, it kind of like give them the uh, confidence to start with their own work and it's okay. Uh, they're not going to get the for, you know, not having a, a, the most efficient way of writing the program, but at the same time, they're learning by seeing what it is. And there, there are a couple of different tools that I use in my courses. In more advanced courses, we have some platforms that we use for um, actually using AI to, uh, to create um, some of the more advanced data structures. But anyway, let's go ahead and um, move forward to the next question that we have, which is now we know what we do for um, uh, our students, but how do we, uh, utilize generative AI as an educator to make ourselves more efficient. We're going to start with Christina. So um, I'll give another example on this one. Um, I find that I am not always the best at writing instructions for my students. Um, sometimes I will have this grand idea for a project and I release my instructions and I get things that aren't <laughs> what I thought I asked for. Um, and when I go back and, and read my own instructions, I can totally understand the confusion um, and, and why I may not be getting the results um, that I wanted. So I tried using, um, I used Microsoft Copilot and I tried using Copilot um, by telling it what I wanted from my students. The example is when we're talking about globalization, um, I ask my students to explore another country and look at the cultural norms and what type of etiquette, you know, do you need to have during business meetings or um, if you're going out to a meal, those types of things. And so I told 
uh, Microsoft Copilot, what I wanted from my students, the output. And it did a fantastic job of generating the instructions for my students. And not only did it clean up my instructions and make them more understandable, it also added some really great examples and some categories that I had not initially thought of, such as, you know, gift giving um, or when you're closing a business deal, that sort of thing. So um, I used it to improve my own instructions. Um, I did have to go back in and clean up after ChatGPT. It can get a little wordy sometimes. Um, but I really appreciated some of the things that it added to my instructions. And I felt not only did it make me more efficient, it made me more effective. Um, my students were much better able to understand what I was asking for. And they seemed to have a lot of fun with the discussion, you know, especially given the additional categories that um, that Copilot added. Thank you, Christina. Adla? Thank you, Christina. I'm going to add up, add on to what you said. I'm I'm doing exactly what you are doing also. And as I mentioned earlier, I plan to improve my instructions for our students to make it more understandable. And um, instead of me sitting down and thinking and thinking, how do I write this? How do I change the language? If I use AI and I, I use generative AI for that, it becomes a little easier. It becomes less, you know, I, I use less time, which means I'm increasing my efficiency on this. And I do go and look at the output that is provided and then tweak it to what I'm trying to say. Or what I, there, there are stuff that I may not really require. So I use that as a template, you could say, or a skeleton to build up on. And um, you know, as far as now it's concerned, I have been using this to improve my instructions, to make them more understandable and more, you know, making more making sense for our students so that they can they can do their work more efficiently. So that that way I'm using less time rather than sitting down and putting my thinking cap on and writing my instructions. And I think they're great. No, they were not great because some students didn't get it. So that's, that's one way I'm trying to improve and become more efficient using generative AI. Thank you, Emma. Julie? Yeah, I'll give a practical example as well. So recently I've been making with one of our instructional designers a warm-up type assignment that really focuses on vocabulary that students need in accounting. That's an area where I have seen students struggle a lot is they get into homework and they don't understand the vocabulary because they haven't been reading their books. They're just trying to jump in and get their homework done so quickly. And so one of the things I've done is take some of our accounting vocabulary and ask ChatGPT to come up with definitions that, you know, a, a 10 year old would understand or examples that are very uh, low level. And I try to use, again, my knowledge, having been in the industry with the examples it gives me to kind of mesh together an understanding that, you know, some of our students who don't have as great of reading comprehension or might be learning English as a second language would find easier to understand before they skip over to their homework and just start working. And so that's an area that I found chat GPT helpful to come up with some very basic definitions of our terms very quickly. So, uh, but again, I'm reviewing it, I'm editing it, but it gives me a, a starting point for our vocabulary words. Thank you so much. And um, I use it, um, I, I use it in different ways as well. Um, one of the things that I use it and, and it works really well for me is uh, creating rubrics um, for the assignments that I have. And another way is I created a little chat bot. I usually have, I've always had syllabus quizzes for my students. Um, but um, this time I just ran my syllabus through the chatbot and I had it create questions for me of the syllabi that I have about the important parts. And that's um, another way that I use it for myself. And another thing that I use it a lot is proofreading. Proofreading, proofreading, proofreading. That is one of the things that is going to help me be much more efficient and faster when I want to um, write to my assignments, write to my um colleagues and I want to make sure that you know everything is there I write it and I run it through it and make sure that everything is is correct so there's so many different ways that we can actually use AI um, in our classes so we, what we did we put together collectively some of the tools that you can use 
in your classrooms. And I created a video um, to use, I, I created like series of videos on how we can use some of these um, step-by-step instructions of how we can use some of these. And I put that in the chat for you guys. So you can do it, you can watch that on your own time because everybody all the time they talk about uh, what these tools are, use it, use it, but how you use it is the most important part. How do you download it? How do you get it? How, what is the steps in, 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 you know, you have to take in order to be able to actually use it, how you can safeguard it so it doesn't get your information. So I, I created a little uh, series of small little videos that goes over a couple of common, top common AI um, uh, tools that people usually talk about and they use, and I will put that um, in the chat in a little bit. So these are some of the tools. I want to go ahead and point Christina to talk about Copilot since that's um, that's her thing, and she actually brought it up to our attention that you know that through Lone Star College we all have access um, to the free version of it, not the not the paid version, but you know it's a Microsoft Copilot, and I want to make it very clear that this is different than uh, GitHub Copilot. GitHub Copilot, if you have any um, faculty around here or any educators in computer science, that's the one you definitely want to invest in and look at it. It's $10 a month. And with that, you can get your own coding assistant. It's great for students as well. But this is different. This is the uh, Copilot. It's, uh, it's a Microsoft Copilot. Christina? So um, Copilot is Microsoft's tool. And um, currently in the business world, it's what most students are probably going to encounter. Um, and to a point that uh, Julie made in, in an earlier conversation, you most companies um, would get pretty upset if an employee was putting sensitive company information into chat GPT, which can become part of the database, right? Um, companies can license Microsoft Copilot and with that license, the security measures are built into it. So an employee's level of access is taken into consideration. They won't have access to company information that they're not permitted to in other company systems. Um, and then anything they put into Microsoft Copilot through the company's license is also, uh, it can be restricted by the company, whether or not it's added back to the database. Um, so personally in my classes, that's what I'm asking my students to use just because um, I think it's the most likely tool currently, who knows what's coming in the future, um, but currently I think it's the most likely tool that they're going to encounter. Um, and it's going, it's currently built into uh, Microsoft Word, PowerPoint, um, Excel, as well as Microsoft's um, Dynamics product, which is kind of like uh, our iStar that we use. Um, so we don't currently license that that portion of it at Lone Star, but at least they'll be familiar with um, the basic tool. And the URL is up on the slide. If you're logged in to your um, web version of Outlook, just type that URL in and you'll be logged into the Lone Star version of Copilot and your students can use that as well. Thank you, Christina. Julie, do you wanna talk about the one you use in your classes? Yeah, I, I'm also having my students use Copilot again for the same reason, because business is very Microsoft oriented. So I am having my students use Copilot now. But then I also, for my own class, have been making new banners and graphics to make my class look a little more engaging. And so in Adobe, Adobe Express, I find very easy to use. It's licensed by Lone Star. We all have access to it through the Adobe suite. And I've been using it to make banners, but if I can't find an image like I might want, it now has the ability to generate images from text, which is built in. And I'm not a graphic designer, I'm not an expert, but um, in the bottom corner on the left, there's an image that I generated of a person at a cash register doing a business transaction. And I gave it text for an image that I was looking for, the style that I wanted, the color scheme I wanted, and. It, it, it was a good way for me to generate images that make my class more engaging or appealing to students while they're in my content of my course. So that's another way that I've found to incorporate. I'm not having students use that yet. I'm just using that as an instructor to, to again, generate images or banners to use in my course that are, you know, copy license free that I'm free to put into my class. 
Thank you, Julie. And a couple of ones that I use for my coding classes, uh, the introductory uh, computer science classes, the Kodi, um, it's a great way we can implement it using um, Visual Studio Code. We can put it in there and we um, can actually use it as um, as part of a, a coding assistant and it can totally help you. And uh, for our students, sometimes our students uh, want to get tutors and we don't have tutors available, but Cody can be their personal tutor as well. Another one that I really like is Llama. Llama is run locally and it runs off of um, Visual Studio Code as well. And what I like about it with most generative AIs and, and um, assistive technologies, you need to be connected to internet. With Llama, that's not the case. You can actually completely use it static and not have to do anything with um, internet. And that's that's something that I really, really like. Um, other tools like Quizlet, like Cloud, Bing Chat, uh, Brad AI, now it's Gemini. I don't know how many of you guys um, work with that, uh, but these are some of the tools. One place that I uh, find out that they keep updating the new AI tools, is MIT. It's a generative MI. This is the, the uh, you can search for this. And if you want, I can um, send the link to you later after uh, this presentation. The teaching with the generative AI resource hub at MIT, it actually takes you and break it down to what is it that you're using. If you're using um, you know, for essays and, and more of like a writing, if you're creating image, if you're doing programming. So th there are like different uh, topics that they have. And all you have to do is just like, you know, go to that um, uh, website that talks about the teaching with generative AI resource hub at MIT. And that will give you all of those um, information. And it, it's a really nice um, tool to a resource to have. Now, um, with that said, we can open it up for questions and answers, and we would like to um, see if we can answer some of the questions that um, some of our colleagues have, or some of our attendees have. Sure, yeah, there's a few questions left that you guys didn't answer during this, so I guess we can start with those. Um, the first question in here asks, how about AI for making rubrics? Um, does anybody want to answer that question? I can answer that one. I actually, um, I tried using AI for my rubric um, last week <laughs> and it, it, it was hit or miss. I got some really good information, but I don't think it generated a rubric that I would use out of the box. Um, but I really liked some of the wording. So I, I, I took what it gave me with a grain of salt. I tweaked it and I think it's better than what I would have come up with on my own. Um, but I also wouldn't have used what, um, what it gave me on its own. So yes. Okay. Here's the next question. It says, um, has anyone used AI in Spanish or any other language? Um, no. That's no. great. <laughs> that, that, that's a, a great question. I, I know that they have capabilities of translation and, and, you know, doing all of that. I personally haven't, but that would be something um, to discuss further, <laughs> explore further. Okay, and the last question that's in here, it says, do we have AI tutors in science? Yes, there are many different uh, platforms that you can use uh, for sciences. Now, um, one of the things that we need to pay attention to is um, how we actually ask questions from AI. I'm just going to um, talk about ChatGPT chat right now. You can ask ChatGPT and prompt engineer what exactly you want it. You can have them put a hat on anybody you want. You can, any students or any anybody can go and say, I want you to act like a computer science professor or a chemistry professor, and I want you to explain to me and then what the question is. And the more descriptive you are, the more um, specific you are, the better answer you're going to get. And if you didn't get the answer, you can simply say, I want you to do better. You failed at answering my question. You can you can certainly talk to uh, chat GPT like that, and, and you can definitely um 
get your answers. And as a matter of fact, if you guys want, we have 10 minutes or nine minutes, we can do a little demo of, of um, the paid version of chat GPT over here and just like, you know, go over it and ask some questions. And let's do the Spanish, Spanish question. Let me see if I can share this very quick. I think somebody mentioned in the chat that I have used it in Spanish. Mm -hmm. And it works the same way than it does in English. That's what it says. Oh, perfect. I think Maria also shared a free AI tutor for many different subjects. She's provided a link. Can you guys see my page? Yeah, it's just come up. It's just come okay. up. All right. So um, do you guys want to just give me some prompts to, to start using? Act as a computer professor and write a, a Java code that calculates the Tax and, and notice I'm making like you know mistakes in here, but look at it. Uh tax for a hundred dollar phone. And there it is. Now let's say I want to make a lecture for this, and I'm gonna say. Now create an image of a phone that is blue. If I can put it in there. It's creating an image. Make it look like cartoonish. And while it's doing this image loads, it asks, uh, does the code always work? Yes. So now um, let's say create a rubric for the um programming assignment that uses java and has to solve um the tax problem we just talked about Do we have any comments in the chat that you know anybody wants to try anything? I have one you can try, Nina. Tell me. Um, so this is a business example. Um, you can ask it uh, to summarize Apple's latest uh, latest financial statements or quarterly Apple's statements. Latest financial statement. So I'm gonna stop the other one so I can run this one. So, I mean, the sky is the limit, what we can do and what we can get out of it. But one thing that we all need to be very cautious, these tools are using training. And when they use training, um, there is definitely gonna be mistakes in there because we don't even know how they're getting trained as we go along every day. And so it is very important that we do our due diligence. It, it great, It's a great tool um, to, use it to enhance our work, but we certainly can't um, depend on it to do the work for us. And here is um, the financial statement that it gave for the first quarter. Thank you, Christina, for that. 
Now, another thing is great in creating um, tables. So I wanna say, create a table that compares the pros and cons of using AI in education. And it's gonna create a table for me and it's gonna tell me the pros and cons of using AI. So um, let's, let's try this. Let's translate this table to Spanish. Let's see if it does that. <laughs> Just gonna pop in real quick and say this is our five minute morning. If you have a last minute question and chime in, just go ahead and drop in the QHA. Oh, there it is. It is translating it, yeah. It's translating it to Spanish for us. Nina, there's a question uh, in the chat which, uh, mm -hmm. which says, is it fair for professors to use AI to make their job easier, but forbid students to use AI? Okay, for assistance on writing papers or reports. That is that is a great question. Um, and that goes but who by who actually um forbids AI in their courses and how they do it. Does anybody want to answer that question? I personally think AI is a great tool for everybody to enhance their work, whether if it's a student, a faculty member, an administrative, anybody, but we should not depend on it to actually do the work for us. We really need to do our due diligence and mm -hmm. have the work and make it better. But anybody else? I'll go back to my guardrails comment. Um, I, I think that it is fair for faculty to use it um, ethically. <laughs> And I think it is our duty to train our students to use it ethically. Um, I, I don't think we should be uh, having our students copy our instructions, put it in AI and spit out the results. And they've learned nothing. So, um, I, but I do think we have to equip them for the world that they're, they're walking into. So um, I don't know if it's a question of fairness because I don't tell them that they can't use it, uh, but I, I think it's our duty to to give them the guardrails and to show them what the expectations are going to be as they enter the workforce. And um, as for my students, I do let them use AI, um, but I try very hard to make my rubrics and the way that I create my assignments in a way that um, they can actually use AI to enhance their work rather than just like giving me whatever it is that the AI, um, there has to be critical thinking behind it. And actually that has made my work harder because now I have to think more and I have to come up with more ideas as to how I can do that. So, and, and I always, I'm very um, open with my students and I let them, especially in software engineering world and computer science world, they're starting to become the developers, not the users. So I always tell them the beginning of the semester, I have it, you know, everywhere. And I um, put it in an email and I tell them, I let them know that um, don't let AI is still the uh, advantages and the potentials you have to learn what you need to become that developer that you want. Let it, you know, enhance your um, ability and what you can do to get better at, uh, you know, whatever it is, you know, the developer and the software engineer you want to become. So that's basically what um, I use, how I use it, how I communicate it. I'm very open. I share my vulnerabilities with the students. We all are learning. This is a work in progress. Doesn't matter if you come from a, a computer science background or not, this is new for all of us. And this is a, a learning land. And every single person right now is trying to adjust and adapt. Um, so forbidding it, I think it's not right because like, you know, like with my children, if I tell them to don't do something, they're gonna find ways to uh, to lie about it and do it. And that's just like a normal being, you know, human being, that's psychology. But um, I hope that answered your question. I don't forbid, I, I don't know who forbids it, um, but I think we all can collaborate and move forward with um, embracing the new technology that it's gonna dare to stay. Nina, can I just add an analogy to this, something that I've tried out for years? Once upon a time, I had it in my syllabus not to use cell phones in the classroom. And then I evolved into a situation where I actually mentioned in the syllabus, you can use uh, cell phones in the classroom to do this, this, this. So it's, I think AI falls in that same category. If we forbid them, you know, they're going to still use it and do it in the wrong way. But rather than if you, if it's open, I think they become more participative and they're they more inquisitive. Uh, how how can I use it for my benefit? 
So that's that's how I look at it. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. I think that's about it. That's our time, and uh, we're done. I really appreciate you guys taking the time and joining us this session. Thank you, everyone.